then uh, what's interesting about GPT is it can actually uh, be used for generating synthetic uh, clinical notes, right? So why, why it's important? Because if you want to share data across uh, institution, or you, if you want to share data in general, uh, the law in the U.S. you can actually it's pretty hard uh, to share peer charts. So synthetic data will be a way because naturally it doesn't contain any of the PHR because all the PHR are fake, right? So this is the motivation of this. Um, but, and uh, it's actually pretty uh, impressive. And the other thing about GPT-3 is now you can do what we call prompt training. Uh, in the past, in BIRM models, all the training are fine-tuning tasks. Now we use prompt training. Basically, you supply very short prompt into your model, and they will generate all the rest, okay? So this is actually a real-world example. The prompt we provide is only the header of uh, one of the example nodes, right? Impression around the area of decreased actuation in the posterior, and that's it. And it generated all the rest of the content by itself, by the language model. And uh, if there's connection here, uh, you can read it, and it actually makes sense. It's a real, realistic patient profile, okay? Um, I'm gonna switch, oh, the laser actually works, okay. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, the Gatortron, the burn model is available. It's on NVIDIA, N NGC. So one question that is very crucial to, to the viewer is how do you, how you assure that it's gonna be, it's using not this code that you, uh, you are, I mean, the language model you are creating? What? Private, Private data? No, so yeah, so good question. So we actually did identify the nodes. We, we de-identified the nodes with the uh, pipeline that we've built. So it, it removed most of, it's not 100%, it removes about 95, 96% of the PHI. And then uh, we use that nodes to train the burn model. And burn model is a little bit safer because even you use it to generate text. The model itself is just uh, vectors of numbers, right? It itself doesn't have any meaning. But you can use the model to, like this, generate synthetic tasks. Right, so burn model is a little bit safe because the memory is short, so it's not gonna be able to reproduce the PHI theoretically. We have not released the Singatatron model because of that reason, because the, the GPT-3 model can actually reproduce a large chunk of PHI by itself, even if we de-identify the nodes at the beginning. So we have not <laughs> released this yet. Have not. Facebook, yeah. Yeah, that's too quick. That's too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. I mean, obviously, we want to do all of those and try it. So the problem, a lot of time, is. When you do massive experiments with that data, the parallelization is hard. The OPT model itself is available, but how you make the training efficient is actually difficult. So just the BIRD model, the uh, nine billion uh, parameter BIRD model, it took us uh, 15 days runtime on a thousand GPUs. A thousand GPUs, 15 days runtime. And the synthetic one on the five, terabyte, on the five billion parameters, that's seven days on a small scale. And the 20, and the 20 billion, our estimate is gonna take about 45 days. So, <laughs> so without parallelization, that's just infeasible. So, um, so that's why it's actually interesting. So if you have access to a NVIDIA platform, uh, think about it. So um, the rest, uh, I'm gonna switch gear and talk about um, some of the other studies, um, but about, I'm probably not gonna go into too much depth there. So this is just a study uh, we did in terms of assess um, the impact of exposon, what do we call exposon, 
uh, on COVID-19 uh, severity. It's founded by uh, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And uh, the hypothesis is um, the COVID-19 severity uh, could be impacted by um, these factors, natural factors, the built environment, and the social environment, right? The natural factors are air pollution, extreme weather, the uh, built environment is the uh, walkability of your neighborhood, the greenness, and then the social environment, whether you are living in a, a, a low economic status neighborhood. And the result, this is actually the result. And as you can see, PM uh, 2.5 composition, which is a harmful particle, and uh, some of the other factors actually related to more severe COVID-19 infections. So, it has some merit of that, right? But again, these are actually prediction models. These are associations. These are not causations. There's no direct causation that we can make saying uh, PM2.5 uh, is leading to COVID, severe, severe COVID, okay? Um, and the exposon is an interesting topic because uh, the exposon contain two uh, things, uh, what do we call? internal exposon and the external exposon. So the exposon concept is basically um, the human body exposed to, right? Exposure of certain things. So internally, your body is uh, exposed to your internal microbiome, the multiple omics, that's the internal exposon. And then the external exposon are the social, natural, and the built environment. And all of these actually composed to drive your health outcomes. And the external exposon um, are actually, large part of it is also social determinants of health. Um, but the problem with exposon data is um, it has various spatial and temporal resolution, right? So these are all coming from public data sources. Uh, for example, your, um, your weather data can come from EPA, right? your pollution data can come from EPA. And some of their sources have a resolution to the degree of like 100 meter circle. But some of the other data are based on county or based on state even, right? So how do you harmonize them is an important uh, methodological issue. And then uh, the exposure space is big. Um, the database that we created is a, has about 9,000 different exposure parameters. And now how do you actually do variable selections? And how do you do the harmonization? How do you do the spatial temporal linkage? Because you have to link individual patients to the specific exposures they have. And typically that's based on residential history where the patient lives. And then the spatial temporal aggregations. And then you can do your disease uh, prediction tasks. So all of these are actually very important uh, topics. So if you're interested in this, we actually have a review paper, I think published early this year, looking at all these different methodology issues. How much time do I have? Uh, five more minutes? Five more minutes? Yeah. Then I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed up quite a bit. Um, so this is another project that we're doing, what do we call uh, drug repurposing. So that's actually looking at uh, drugs that's already on the market. So one of the most famous example for drug repurposing is actually Viagra. So Viagra used to be a hypertension drug. Um, and then they find out Viagra can actually uh, help with ED. So that's actually a case of uh, drug repurposing. So what we're trying to do conceptually is to identify those drug signals and see whether they can help with ADRD, so Alzheimer disease-related dementia, which is an unsolved uh, mystery right now. So there's really no treatment for Alzheimer's disease at all. Um, and uh, what the, the methods we propose is actually through uh, AI, looking at uh, combining knowledge graphs with the EHR data, do mutual learning, okay? So, this is actually what we built. There are tons of uh, existing knowledge graphs out there, a lot of them about, for example, genes, uh, some of them about diseases, some of them about drugs. 
but they are disconnected. So one thing that we've done is actually link them together, harmonize the concepts, have them having the linkage. Right? And uh, this is actually released on the GitHub as well, so you can actually access this. So at the end, we created a huge harmonized knowledge graph, biomedical knowledge graph, uh, containing 36 million uh, entities, about 65 million uh, relations. And then through graph neural network learning, we actually identified specific uh, drug molecules that can act on Alzheimer's disease through different genes, right? And then we tested our hypothesis using the EHR data through a causal inference part uh, methods called trial emulation, right? And uh, uh, so if you're interested in this, uh, there's a lot of material on how do, you do, how do you do causal inference based on observational data. The first thing you have to think about is a lot of the data bias, selection bias and the data biases. Um, but based on this, we can actually produce a number of uh, drug signals that can, uh, based on numbers, reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And the next step is actually to test it uh, in either a well lab or looking at molecular uh, kind of pathways. So that's what's going on with this study. I'm not gonna talk about this. This is uh, uh, another study about factory learning because when you deal with uh, data across different uh, sites, you really have to think about how do you do learning without leaking e uh, private data, right? So this is actually a federal learning uh, algorithms. And uh, I'm gonna go through quickly. So what I've talked about is natural language processing, social determinants, causal inference, using observational data, and making connections to create a complete picture of the patient. So these covers um, basically all the things I've, I've talked about. And uh, I have a few other slides that's really uh, talking about how do you actually uh, go about causal inference. I don't think I have time to go through, but it has a lot of references. So if you wanna take a look at the rest of the slides, please feel free. That's a loaded question, so let me st start with privacy. So that's why we do de-identification a lot, right? We remove identifiers. We remove patient's name, social security number, drive license number, a lot of them before we actually share, right? So that's why we create de-identification solutions. All the data in Florida is HIPAA limited. It only have dates and locations. All the other identifiers are removed. And then, that's the other reason for distributed learning, right? You can hold the data within your institute and you can share parameters that's learned from your data and you can aggregate, train a bigger, better model. So those are solutions that we are exploring. And the privacy law in the States is crazy. So uh, there's no way I can like share PHR data out at all uh, in most cases. There are very few cases I, we can share limited number of patient charts outside of the institution. So the second question is about uh, how much. Um, so One Florida started in 2009 with a pilot within Uni uh, University of Florida. That's only 50K, $50,000. Um, currently, I actually have a slide on like uh, the, the, the cost and the revenues that we generate, but I didn't include. Uh, but currently, we've spent about 40 million in the last 10, 13 years on One Florida, the computing infrastructure, how to get data from the partners and all that. Uh, just by sheer number, 
the computing infrastructure, we, we are paying about $600,000 a year to just host it. So the data is about 20 terabytes uh, of data. Okay, so it costs a lot of money. Um, a lot of the money coming from uh, federal grants, but some of them coming from uh, institution as well. But the flip side is we generate 200 and 300 million dollar revenue through contracts and grants, right? So we actually have pharma company contracts because they are looking at these data as well. They want to do study with us and we do cost recovery with the pharma company. So, so I think that's a good question. So think about business model, right? How do you actually run a data infrastructure sustaining it, right? And uh, in terms of sharing, collaboration for sure. So the typical collaboration way is we would add, identify a one Florida investigator like in the States and collaborate with you. May not be exchanging the individual level patient data, but again, we can exchange model parameters, we can exchange study protocols and build the model together. So that's a typical collaboration way, easy to start. Sure. Um, you mentioned HIPAA. Yeah. So we have a project to do something to do with personal health libraries, mm -hmm. so that they can share data across the country. Um, I was wondering, is there any way uh, we could have access to the data to test this model that you are doing? If I'm putting my uh, UF Health chief data scientist role, from a scientific perspective, I would say yes, it would be great to test it. Uh, from the institution uh, politics, or it, it varies, you, you know, you're in the States, right? Yeah. So every institution is different. So some of them are really risk averse, don't want to release any data out. Some of them are more liberal on sharing data. So. Uh, there are a lot of formal protocols we can put in, go through IRB, go through DUA, data use agreement, go through the uh, security and risk assessment, uh, and if it's uh, uh, all the security control in place, yes? I'll talk to you after that. Okay. So, okay, so you're talking about linkage, right? So link, linkage has, I actually have a paper specifically about like linkage and, uh, and evaluate it based on the data that we have. Um, so the linkage typically happen based on, name, I mean, very, very typical, rule-based deterministic linkage, right? So based on name, date of birth, gender, race, ethnicity, right? If you combine all those, what we call pseudo-identifiers, uh, you can pretty much accurately identify a person, pinpoint to a specific person, right? You can have certain missingness, but if you have all of them missing, then there's no point to link at all, right? So that's impossible. So uh, you can build different linkage rules, and uh, we're actually using multiple linkage rules. So a lot of them are based on first, last name, or even just last initial, then plus uh, maybe the zip code, the date of birth, the gender, the race, and then basically permutation of those different uh, a combination of pseudo identifiers into rules. And if one of them hit, then uh, it will determine it's a link. And uh, we evaluate it based on the gold standard data and which ones have best performance in terms of precision and recall. I, I don't want to correct the question, but I have a chance to ask question as well. Uh, sure. Since you work a lot with EHI, uh, yes. one big problem of this for EHI is that they don't have the data to share with Yeah. So I just didn't show it. Okay. <laughs> I, I have okay. additional slides. How do you, how, do you, how do you deal with this missing data, missing data? Because it's, it's a big problem just in Florida, even if it's the most yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. So my recommendation is, one, continue to build your data infrastructure, right? So that's addressing missing information, sorry, from the source, which means you have to collect more, right? You, that's why we linking different health systems for the same patient, we're linking to the claims, we're link, linking to national death index to have death information, we're linked to tumor tree for cancer, cancer data. So one, continue to expand your infrastructure. Right, that's why we built EHRs. And the second part is methods. So I don't like imputation, right? But there are more sophisticated methods that can account for missingness. Obviously, it cannot be like 90% of missing, and then there's no point. <laughs> it has to be some uh, threshold of it. And there are very robust methods you can use to actually either do imputation or account for missingness in the statistical or machine learning models. So that's, that's my recommendation, do it both ways. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, thank you very much. Si tienen alguna pregunta en español, lo pueden hacer, la podemos traducir igualmente. Si no, thank you very much, John, uh, sure. for your presentation.
that integrate various and heterogeneous information sources to represent the knowledge above certain domain, domains of discourse. For instance, the statement, the University of the Altiplano is located in the city of Puno. <coughs> it is a simple statement or triple. The triple structure is subject, predicate, and object. Now, we have a basic statement or triple. A knowledge graph is composed by a simple triple, which can be expanded by adding more statements about a subject or entity, more objects, and relationships between them can be added, which will result in a graph. <coughs> knowledge graphs have proven to be very useful for applications such as personal assistance, for example, Alexa, question answering systems uh, like Wolfram Alpha, and search engines, uh, <coughs> for instance, Google Search. In the knowledge graph context, and to the best of our knowledge, there is no dedicated knowledge graph for the Quechua language. And knowledge, the most approximate knowledge graph to be considered on this matter may be Wiktionary or Wikidata. However, they have some limitation as shown on the table. <coughs> the principal limitation has um, uh, orient, or their, their orientation Okay. <coughs> now, <coughs> how are we creating the Quechua knowledge graph? We adopted the approach proposed by Pencil et al. This approach starts with the knowledge creation, then knowledge hosting, knowledge creation, and finally with knowledge deployment. In the knowledge creation phase, we first we identified sources and defined domain specifications. In the Quechua knowledge graph, we first identify like Quechua dictionaries, vocabularies, and so on. One of the source we started to work with was the Runasimi dictionary, which contains more than 22,000 words described in different languages. For the domain specifications, we modeled what properties or features must, must be described for each type of instance in the Quechua knowledge graph. As shown on the right side image, for instance, <coughs> a lexem type should be described with language category, lexical category, and some other properties. For the knowledge hosting phase, the Quechua knowledge graph, we have chosen the Wikibase cloud, which provides various components and features, such as MediaWiki, Wikibase, MariaDB, and Sparkle support. To build a high light <coughs> quality Quechua knowledge graph, it is important to create it. For instance, a manual creation is not recommended due to large size of knowledge graphs. Therefore, there are some tools that can automatize the creation tasks, such as OpenRefine, Wikibase Import, and Entity Schema, which are supported by Wikibase. Uh, we have built the Quechua Knowledge Graph, which provides various ways ways of being easily used and deployed. For instance, an enhanced uh, graphical user interface, which allows the users edit them faster and more productive. A Sparkle endpoint, it is the standard care service of the Quechua knowledge graph, and means to export the knowledge contained in the Quechua knowledge graph. So, why is building a Quechua knowledge graph important? 
because the availability of interoperable linguistic resources is not always more urgent in order to save and help <coughs> and, uh, and the resourced languages and their communities. For instance, there are only a few resources available for the Quechua language, and they are mostly in unstructured format. To the best of our knowledge, there is no a knowledge graph dedicated to the Quechua language, knowledge and their community. In order to overcome these limitations, in this paper we propose the Quechua knowledge graph, which aims to support harmonization process of the Quechua language and knowledge. From an organizational point of view, there is one main factor that may endanger the success of the Quechua knowledge graph. Without Quechua community, the initiative will certainly fail. There are also several factors that might compromise the success of the Quechua knowledge graph. First of all, it's likely to fail without dedicated tools to support tasks such as schema modeling, population of modeled schema, knowledge assessment, and knowledge carrying. In conclusion, we have built the Quechua knowledge graph, which stores Quechua language and Quechua knowledge. We set up a Wikibase instance called Quechua Base. With Quechua Base, we hope to support the Quechua community, developers, and scientists. You can check the Quechua knowledge graph in the link. Thank you. a different structure to translate. Community with a great community that can be realized. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I have one question. What do you think is the next step for your work? Sorry, could yeah. you repeat? The next step, okay? Because in the first step, uh, as I'm seeing, you build a knowledge graph based on the Quechua language. But what do you think is the next step of your work? After creating knowledge graph? Yeah. Hosting knowledge graph. Hosting or making? knowledge graph for other languages, I don't know how complicated it is to, to extract this information in the beginning. Okay, quisiera este, ayudar a la comunidad este, 
eh, a la, ayudar a la comunidad en Quechua. A, y este, una de las principales limitaciones que tenemos eh, para trabajar con esto es la cantidad de data estructurada que hay. Entonces, con esto podemos ayudar a estructurar data y así eh, podemos ayudar también a nosotros. O sea, si tal vez intentamos hacer un, un trabajo futuro, bueno, lo vamos a hacer, pero también si otras personas lo intentan, eh, ya van a tener algo sobre qué trabajar. Eh, ese sería nuestro... Any other question? y que no, como que habías discriminado por completo en la Aymara. Pero si se trata, como preguntó el joven del quechua del norte, del centro y del sur, ¿se podría, que, ¿se podría hacer como un nuevo proyecto de generalizar los tres tipos de quechua? Eh, por el momento estamos procurando que eh, no enfocarnos tanto en los tipos de quechua que hay, ya que algunas personas toman esto como si, digamos, eh, uno se enfoca primero en el quechua del norte, el quechua del norte terminaría opacando, ¿verdad?, al, al del sur. Entonces, estamos intentando no tomar este enfoque por ahora, eh, así que eh, nos estamos enfocando, o sea, int intentamos hacer, eh, ser lo más neutrales posible, pero estamos trabajando sobre el quechua del sur. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Denis Marcel Smith Fernandez, I'm a Bachelor of Science from Computer Science Department of Universidad Católica San Pablo. Today I'm going to talk about my article research called Image Generation from Sketches and Text Guide Attribute Edition. Every day, new, new deep learning models are created, existing ones are modified uh, um, or combined to extend the range of application and tasks that this model can solve. Uh, in this paper, I will present a, no, a new a novel approach that will combine two, model, two actual concepts that are popular nowadays, that is the natural processing language and generative adversarial networks. So one challenging problem is uh, generate re realistic images that match semantically given a test description. So there are many approaches that try to solve this problem. This is an example uh, from Midjourney model who is capable to produce a uh, novel scenes from a given test description. It is shown that using a generative uh, model uh, could improve the quality and the fidelity of the image that we are generating. Uh, moreover, we could generalize the learning in a, in a kind of zero-shot learning who can improve the generative phase. So through years, many problems have been addressed by using a combination of models and algorithms uh, to solve different tasks and to make different frameworks, to make different applications. This could include the modification of the actual uh, model architecture. Uh, we could uh, 
uh, add the steps in the generation phase. We could train a new classifier for the discriminator uh, model. And also we can add or modify the last function that we use when in the generation phase. So that we can take advantage of some uh, information source that we could have missed during previous uh, training phase. It's important to understand first uh, some concepts about the two models that I am using to, to create this new model. Uh, first is the generative adversarial model. Since the field of artificial intelligence have evolved notably, uh, the presence of, of models like transformer and generative adversarial networks have facilitated to the development of, uh, of many new models uh, that can generate realistic images. In this case, uh, the generative adversarial network has become very popular uh, in the recent years because of their capacity to solve uh, processing imaging problems, and it is formed of two networks. Uh, one is called generator, the other one is called discriminator. In a base case of the use of this, uh, net, uh, of this model, uh, the generator replicates an uh, image, a synthesis image from, uh, from, the, from a data set of, of real images. Meanwhile, the discriminator uh, take the output of the generator and compare it with a, with a real image, and then it decides whether the generator image is fake or real. In the case it is fake, uh, the generator, uh, we apply a loss function to the generator, so we can improve the generation of new results, uh, which has a better, a better image. Uh, the main idea is to have a probability a distribution uh, over a, a, a data set of images, which will generate a probability that the new image that we are generating uh, uh, comes from the original data set we are using to train the, the generator. Uh, here, this is a, a graphical representation of the main architecture of a generative adversarial network. Uh, which is capable of generating new image uh, from sketches. In this case, we take uh, first the, the real image and we extract the edges and, and put it as an input for the generator, uh, which will go through uh, five convolutional layers. And then it, it is sent to the discriminator, which will decide is it, if it is real or fake. Then we have the second part that is uh, natural, uh, natural language processing. In this case, I, I take this transformer model. The, but in the beginning, before this, this model, the autoencoders were they used to, to translate text. Uh, so the ones used for the image generation were the guide text image uh, autoencoders. So uh, the transformer have this uh, encoding decoding architecture, but they, they can also learn contents and thus meaning by uh, tracking relationship between sequ sequential data like the words in the sentence. And it has a fully connected point-to-point -point, uh, architecture and the self-attending part is stuck in layers for the decoder and for the, uh, for the decoder and for the for the encoder. Then we have some state-of-the-art models that are very popular nowadays. First is the DALI model. Uh, this model uses an autoencoder uh, that is trained to, to compress uh, the images in order to generate a high-resolution image because uh, try to predict pixels uh, over a uh, a source of, for example, 2,000 for 2,000 images is very, it costs a lot for uh, talking in a computational way. So that's why they use this autoencoder and, auto, and also they use an autoregressive encoder that is training to, to model a joint distribution between the, the images that they are going to generate. Another uh, popular model that has appeared in, 
in the last year is stable diffusion. The, the stable diffusion is the most recent model uh, for, for text to image translation. Uh, in this work, they decompose the image generation into sequential application of automatic autoencoding. So in addition, uh, this, with this formulation, uh, they allows them to, to have a guidance mechanism for the generated image. So this, if this kind of diffusion models achieve uh, synthesis results that are the most close to, to real images. Um, and they achieve this by, by separating the, gen the generative compressing phase from the generative learning phase. So this kind of model use a, a, a reduced complex uh, space where they will uh, generate the new images. So this is the proposal line, proposed pipeline that I am using for this new model I'm presenting. Uh, first, there will be uh, the first step is the, to process the text. Then we will take it this processing text uh, to the to the generator with uh, along with the sketches, and then we se we will send the output of the generator to the discriminator. Uh, and an extra step is the transfer learning that I, I am using to reduce the cost and the use of resources for the generator. So in the text processing, I will take uh, the, the description, the sentence, and I will, I will extract those words that are more, more important that will give the context to the image that I'm generating from the sketch. Uh, and for the image generation, uh, I will take that that, that, <coughs> that sentence processed by the transformer, and I will join it with the, with the sketch that I extract from a data set of real images. So we have a vector from the real image that is called a tensor, and I will join this tensor with, a, with this vector of features that comes from the, from the, from the words I, I am taking from the sentence. And we will produce a, a new images that combine the, the sketch and the, and the description to produce a new image. Then I will send this as an input for the discriminator that will take a real image from a data set. Uh, it will compare with the new image that I'm generating in the previous phase. So it will decide whether the new image is real or fake. After that, I will, if the image is fake, I will apply a context a contextual loss to the generator to improve the generation of the new images. An extra step I am using is transfer learning, uh, as I mentioned, to reduce the cost of the resources and time. I I transfer the learning from a contextual gun that is training generating phases from a sketch, and uh, so I I pass these uh, ways from this model to the, the, the to, a, to a context that I am using. Finally, these are my results. Uh, in this case, I have a description and a, a sketch that I take from a real image. I have an algorithm to extract the edges, so the, the edges of the real image uh, are the sketches, and the description I join with the sketch and will produce the, the new face that I want with the, with the given description I, I am using. But one problem I, is that sometimes there could be a case where the images that I am generating mismatch the description that I am using for the, for the generation. So we are, try, we are improving this part to avoid this, this kind of cases where the image is not, is not, not, do not correspond to the the natural language description. Uh, finally, we are using a quantitative matrix, uh, two in specific, the inception score and the fraction inception distance, which are scores that are used in the state of the art models. In the case of the inception score, I'm, I'm getting a, 
a minimum value that is better than the other models that use the same data set. And in the case of the fractured inception distance, uh, my score is in the average of the other, compared to the other models that use the same data sets. Finally, some conclusions. Is, uh, we present a new model which is able to generate images from faces and sketches and natural language descriptions. The generative models have shown versatility to add new components or to add extra steps in the generation phase. The proposed model take another approach different from conventional mo contextual models since we take the context from the natural language descriptions instead of taking the context from real images. And finally, uh, uh, the two metrics shown that our score obtained from our model is shown to be below other models which use the same data set. Thank you. case where, for example, the sketch, uh, where the image generated does not match the description, is try to block the area that are generated with a previous feature. For example, if I am uh, editing the attribute uh, near the, the eyes, I will lock that area. The, in, for that, uh, the next feature, for example, could be the nose. Do not try to over overwrite the, the area that has been generated in previous phase. So that one last time. Yes. That might not generate generate well image. Yeah, that's um, Can I start? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wilbur. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about ADRAS, which is a research uh, that I do with my collaborators, Edwin Salcedo and Guillermo Saunero. Uh, ADRAS means Airborne Disease Risk Assessment System for close environments. And in simple words, this system, uh, the system that we are proposing, will warn us if we can catch any disease that is transmitted through air. Uh, so, for example, uh, through this system, we, call, you, we could tell a very well approximation of the risk of spreading COVID in this auditorium. Let's start with a bit of background. Airborne disease always spread easily. Uh, also, each pathogen is different. The way they spread is similar. So the main way of spreading is droplet infection when people cough. And these droplets can be small. The small droplets uh, 
rise to the ceiling, and there are also big droplets which fall to the ground, and the medium droplets which remain floating in the air. And with the arrival of the pandemic, the recommendations like avoiding crowds, wearing face masks, and no touching your face have become popular. But nothing assures us that we will not get infected. This is why we are proposing a computer vision-based system to monitor in real time the spread risk of an airborne disease. As a first step, we have to obtain an epidemiological model, an equation based to design our system. So we found well rail equation. Uh, this equation considers uh, the number of infected people. And here we have a, a problem where, because uh, we don't know this value. So we need to estimate it. Uh, another parameter is pathogen infectivity. It uh, refers uh, how infectious the disease is. Each disease uh, has different infectivity. We must, we must set a value. Uh, that corresponds to the disease that we want to monitor. The inhalation rate refers to the average people breathing. And uh, with an example, it's easier to get infected in a gym than in a restaurant. Although there are the same number of people in both places, this is because in gyms people do exercise, which means that they breathe faster. And this, is, this means that if they are infected, they will spread faster. The room ventilation is an important variable and this variable is why the title of this this research have a foreclosing environments at the end. Of course, we can implement this in an open environment, but uh, it is not necessary uh, because in open place like streets or squares, the ventilation is very high, so cleans those places. and the time, um, it refers to uh, how long the people remains in an environment. In this, uh, Martin Bassant, uh, who is a researcher at MIT, tell us that the risk increase over the time. So it's not the same, uh, the risk in a room that you have with a person for five minutes than if you are in the same room for two hours with an infected person. And in this we add a new parameter because we implement face mask a parameter to consider because we know that if people wear face mask the airborne disease risk reduce so i'm going to explain how we determine each parameter <coughs> the first is 
the number of infected people. So we can use a camera to detect how, how much, how many people are in environment, but we can't determine how infected people there are. So the way that we are used to estimate it is use the percentage of case and the number of people detected by a camera and we get an infected people estimation. The second parameter is the quantum emission rate. And a quanta is a infectious dose unit that measures the particles needed to infect one person. It's the same for each disease. So one quanta of influenza, for example, will infect the same number of people of one, one quanta of COVID-19. This is uh, the only parameter that contains the infectivity of the virus. So we only need to change this value in the equation and we could are monitoring another disease. In this part, if the disease is more contagious, the infected person will be, will have a higher quanta emission rate. And it also depends on the activity we do. Uh, so for example, if we start talking loudly, its value is much higher than if we were just breathing. Uh, the value has to be obtained from a laboratory study. Uh, there are already studies that have analyzed and obtained these values. So for our system, we use information that these papers have already published. The pulmonary ventilation rate, uh, it refers to the inhalation rate of one person. And it is similar to the quanta parameter. It is value increased depending on the activity. Uh, it is lower when a person is laying down, opposed when there is a heavy exercise involved. Uh, so the faster we breathe, the more uh, we will uh, spread. And if we are not getting infected, the same applies. The faster uh, you breathe in a closed place, the more volume of air you inhale and your risk of getting infected increases. Okay. Uh, the ventilation rate uh, of a room uh, has to be calculated because each, each room is different. So we have to calculate and we take account uh, the air velocity and the window area to determine the airflow rate. And with the room volume, we get the ventilation rate in ACH, which is air change per hour. And the percentage of people wearing masks, uh, we know that the probability of getting infection increase if people wear masks and decrease when people uh, don't wear mask. This is the equation, the epidemiological model, and we need to get the 
infected people in real time, and the number of people in real time, and the number of people that are wearing face masks. Uh, to do this, we implement computer vision models. So we use pre-training models uh, for person detection model, and we test it with intersection over union, confusion math, mean average precision F1 score and matrix correlation coefficient. For face mask detection models, transfer learning uh, was implemented in mobile lens and we get a uh, face mask detection. Uh, this is implemented with instruction for uh, OpenCV and this is the equation. So now we get in real time, the person detection model and the face mask detection model, which gave us the, the parameters that we need. Uh, we also implement stereo cameras for get a uh, more complex analysis. And uh, these stereo cameras uh, was given by OpenCV. OpenCV uh, was sponsored us, so he sent us a lot of cameras and we implement in the project and we get a head map to get the total risk and the, the parts of the room that are the most dangerous. And also a Telegram sent us a notification when the risk is uh, higher than, than a threshold. This is a monitoring system, so we can monitor uh, a lot of location, and for each location, there will be a lot of cameras. So we are storing only data that is the person, uh, how many person there are, how many are using face masks, how many are complying with the correct distance, and the total risk calculated. This is a diagram of the end device. And this is how it looks. In the results, uh, we have uh, less than 5% uh, compared with other studies that also analyze uh, with well Riley. So this is the, the results. Uh, thanks for your attention.
given these circumstances, uh, exchange rate uh, policy is essential for uh, assimilating these shocks. Yeah. The exchange rate for Peru, also for any country, uh, is uh, okay. Okay, I will continue with this fast and in Spanish. Okay, el tipo de cambio en exchange rate, eh, tanto para el Perú como para otros países, es uno de los más importantes indicadores económicos. En este caso, eh, una eh, exchange rate prediction es esencial eh, para futuras inversiones. Eh, Ahora, eh, al ser un tema tan relevante, en este caso para, para la situación económica del país, eh, eh, se discute de manera general en diferentes redes sociales. En este caso, debería ser la red social de Twitter, en la cual eh, los usuarios pueden compartir sus puntos de vista acerca de este tema. Ahora, es ahí donde entra la parte del sentiment analysis, que es nuestro instrumento para poder... Eh, para conocer o darnos una idea acerca de cómo eh, las personas tienen su opinión sobre un determinado tópico. En este caso, el eh, tipo de cambio. Ahora, eh, dos tipos eh, generalmente de análisis se eh, hacen para predecir, en este caso, el tipo de cambio. Eh, esto tendría que ser el análisis técnico y el análisis fundamental. Este artículo o en este trabajo se ha hecho eh, aplicando más que nada el estudio de análisis técnico. Eh, se ha hecho recopilando data eh, de la red social de Twitter y también se está recopilando de data bancaria que vendría a ser de la data de BCRP, data y data. En este caso, sobre la red social Twitter, o bueno, ambos archivos están en puntos se se han recopilado. Eh, para la red social Twitter se ha extraído a través de la librería Sunstrike de Python, bajo el keyword de dólar, y se ha estado limitando eh, por el tiempo del 2021. Vendría a ser del 1 de enero de 2021 hasta el 31 de diciembre de 2021. Ahora, esto la recopilación de la data con la librería se, utiliza, se fue dando de manera mensual y el posterior análisis se está haciendo por día. Eh, además de que eh, hay una restricción que podría darse de la librería, esta vendría a ser la localización. Se ha hecho uso de un campo eh, eh, user.location que nos brinda la localización del usuario para filtrarlo para Perú y para Lima. Lima okay. Para el caso de la red eh, data bancaria, vendría a ser la data abierta del BCRP. Eh, si bien es cierto que la data bancaria del BCRP no te brinda información acerca de los días no laborables, que vendría a ser sábado, domingo y los feriados, esta data ha sido posteriormente detectizada, teniendo en cuenta los precios de apertura y cierre del día anterior, para decir posteriormente el, el, precio, o el precio promedio de la versión tipo de cambio del dólar del día siguiente. Ahora, en este caso sería la metodología que se ha eh, tenido eh, desarrollando. Como se puede apreciar, la primera parte debería ser la colección de la data, tanto la data bancaria como la data, eh, la data social. Tienen que discretizarse ambas o tratarse ambas, ¿por qué? Porque, como ya mencioné, la data bancaria hay días que no se está teniendo información, los días no laborables, y con respecto a la data social, porque no está estandarizada, hay información, digamos, de los tweets, que no vendría a ser útil para nuestro análisis. Por eso es que se da eh, diferentes técnicas de preprocesamiento. ¿A qué nos referimos a esto? A las técnicas como transformación texto minúscula, vendría a ser para reducir el, el banco de palabras, de palabras que vendrían a ser esencialmente las mismas, por ejemplo, playa en minúscula y playa en mayúscula, es idéntico. Eh, en mención de hashtag, mención, esto vendría a ser cosas ya propias de Twitter, que no añaden información, que el hashtag de dólar o hashtag, eh, cualquier otro tipo de hashtag que fueran a tener esos tweets y también está la utilización que ya vendría a ser la parte de eh, separar en este caso por, por tokens palabra por palabra eh, de cada uno de los tweets y después el stem también que es para encontrar la raíz o traer la raíz de la palabra eliminando afijos y fijos después de esto se va a dar eh, la vectorización de la data lo que se ha utilizado es el FDF y el NGRAM. en el caso de eh, términos frecuencia de de frecuencia eh, y en el gram, en el gram se ha utilizado unigramas y bigramas, eh, 
organigrama que vamos palabra por palabra y pegamos por pares. Y posterior a eso se ha tenido el primer, la primera fase, que vendría a ser utilizando los algoritmos de Nigel Bayes y Random Forest Classifier. Para, eh, en todo caso, tener esta tendencia, eh, la tendencia diaria de los usuarios con respecto a la versión del tipo de cambio del dólar. Esto va a servir como input para eh, la siguiente fase, que ya sigue utilizando la data bancaria, para realizar el, el forecasting de eh, la variación del tipo de cambio del dólar. Esta data, como había mencionado, es como input, va a estar junto a la data bancaria, se va a unir por día, y se van a utilizar finalmente eh, algoritmos de Super Vector Machine, y Random Forest Regreso. Eh, para la primera parte se está haciendo un entrenamiento de, eh, hay particiones porcentuales de 70 a 30, eh, 80 a 20, 75 a 25, teniendo esta última como mejores resultados. Y para la siguiente parte se tienen dos, eh, dos tipos para entrenamiento, uno es por particiones porcentuales que para Random Forest Regreso es de la misma forma porcentual y lo último que es para Super Vector Machine que es con eh, K-Fold Cross Validation con un K de 5, que sería un K partes, 5 partes y sería este sin número de iteraciones. Eh, bueno, para la configuración, eh, cada uno de estos modelos está trabajando con una cierta cantidad de, de parámetros, así que lo que se hace para encontrar la mejor combinación después de eh, tener una lista, un listado de parámetros es utilizar la librería GitSearchDV de Rekinler para encontrar la mejor combinación en este caso para cada uno de los modelos. Se ha eh, evaluado los modelos de Random Forest Classified, se ha evaluado el modelo de Random Forest Recursor y el Super Vector Machine. Para Naive Bayes se utilizó, bueno, Naive Bayes se utilizó por defecto el que nos brindaba de multinomia Bayes. En este caso, para el primer eh, Classified que vendría a ser la primera fase, eh, tendríamos el eh, número de estimadores con respecto a cuántos árboles iban a hacer, de la misma forma para Recursor teniendo ahí cada una de las mejores combinaciones, más de características, profundidad, serie, etc. En este caso, para Super Vector Machine, de la misma forma, se evaluó en diferentes C, Epsilon y Gamma para encontrar la mejor combinación, teniendo en este caso eh, la siguiente combinación. Luego tenemos los resultados, ya vendría a ser esta parte eh, inicial, ¿no? entrenando ya con la data de todo el 2021. Eh, tendríamos los algoritmos eh, Naive Bayes y Random Forest en la primera parte. Eh, tendríamos eh, para la tanto para la data Unigram y Bigram, en este caso eh, la partición de 75-25% que eran los que tenían mayores resultados. Y después se tendría ya el mejor digamos, resultado que es con Super Vector Machine, eh, utilizando el Cross -for Validation, con un score medio de 0.92%. Eh, teniendo también un error con respecto a la data. Eh, Dicha, que en este caso es el promedio del día siguiente, de error medio absoluto y error eh, medio cuadrático. Es para la validación del modelo se eh, realizó una recopilación nueva de data, es decir, eh, si bien es cierto que hemos entrenado y testeado con la data del 2021, se recopiló data de enero de 2022 para poder eh, encontrar, digamos, eh, bueno, tratar estos resultados. Se recopiló un total de 5.885 tweets para enero. Eh, se realizó, eh, se evaluó, digamos, esta nueva información con el modelo que ya teníamos y en este caso le a ser los resultados eh, de manera gráfica. Como se puede apreciar, aún hay espacio para mejora para la, el, la parte de la predicción del valor de tipo de cambio. Ahí está una contraparte del de valor actual que vendría a ser el valor real y el pre, predicho o predictivo que vendría a ser el, nuestro resultado con nuestra data. En la parte izquierda se muestra la parte de gráfico de líneas y en la derecha la gráfico de barras. Eh, aunque parezca que son grandes, eh, gran tamaños, en realidad son medidas de 3.96 y 3.98, hay pequeñas variaciones de 0.05. Bueno, eh, eso sería todo y ya como conclusiones, uh, estamos hablando de la parte del síntesis de análisis, que se logró ese análisis de la proyección. Eh, Naive Bayes y Random Forest, so far, eh, obteniendo ya su, como mejor resultado eh, la partición porcentual de 75-25%, eh, con un acuerdo aproximado de 90%, y para los resultados de la segunda fase, que vendría a ser ya con Super Vector Machine para el forecasting, eh, se tuvo un 92.82% de 
con una aproximación, en este caso el error, eh, lo mismo que vendría a ser de 2 por 10 a la menos 4. Eh, esto se tiene que tener claro que, digamos, en algunos otros eh, campos reales o correcciones, en otros casos, digamos, otros mercados, eh, fuera del de, de, peruano, que es el tema que se ha tocado, eh, no todo va a estar obviamente 100% eh, de dicho, como se ha visto en la validación del modelo. Y también se tiene el caso de que este modelo eh, puede ser una ventaja, digamos, para, como utilidad para las personas que quieran, eh, digamos, realizar este tipo de, de proyectos. Eso es todo. Excelente. para la parte siguiente era Super Vector Machine y también Random Forest. Se consideró en algún momento eh, también eh, redes neuronales, pero dado que se, por falta de, digamos, de disponibilidad de tiempo ya se dejó apartado y se consideró solamente estos últimos modelos. fue cuando estaba cursando todavía el TC2. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? No, bueno, aprobamos Bueno, muchachos, gracias por haber venido. Por hoy terminamos la, la sesión. Mañana empezamos a las 9 de la mañana. Recuerden que mañana tenemos a expositores de Google y de Facebook, asimismo de, de dos universidades más, de la Universidad de Missouri y de la Universidad de, um, de Florida. Um, y bueno, retomamos mañana, retomamos mañana a las 9 de la mañana, muchachos. Que tengan buenas noches. So let's go. Uh, Hassan and John.